Yeah, thank you very much, Rachel, for, for introducing the platform. I'm very delighted to introduce our speaker today. Welcome, Ingrid Boas. Professor Ingrid Boas is uh, from the Environment Research Group in Wageningen University. Um, and she holds a PhD uh, from Kent University, where she worked on the specialization of uh, climate migration. And she has published widely acknowledged uh, papers on uh, the issue of protection of climate refugees. Um, and, but more recently, she uh, uh, has uh, contributed to a more nuanced understanding of uh, the relationship between environment change and, and migration under the climate mobilities um, uh, concept and approach. And that is what, also what she will uh, talk about today. And she had just recently, congratulations for that one uh, very prestigious uh, grant from the Netherlands, where she uh, will lead a research group in the next five years on the issue of climate-related mobilities in the borderlands. Um, very much uh, looking forward to hear more about that as well. But today, um, um, we will speak about climate mobilities, migration mobilities, and mobility regimes in the changing climate. Um, welcome to Vienna, uh, and so the floor is yours. Right, thank you, Salfa. All right, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for having me here. And, uh, oh yeah, I should step right up. Uh, just one second, put this away. Uh, just on the tiny thing. Maybe. Yeah. Just one second, and then we are. It's here. Yeah, so uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I feel uh, yeah, very welcomed actually in the, in the, uh, the group of uh, Patrick Sacro uh, to, uh, today and yesterday we had uh, yeah, a lot of in-depth conversations and uh, really went in depth about the topic. So it was really uh, enjoyable and also uh, uh, happy also to be able to give this, uh, this lecture also in this, this location is quite uh, uh, special. Um, so what I'm talking about, we'll talk about is about the concept of, of climate mobilities um, and this title on climate mobilities, uh, migration, immobilities, mobilities and mobilities regimes in a changing climate is the title of a, of a special issue that will come out, I think, uh, next week uh, with the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies, uh, in which we set out uh, this concept and research agenda on uh, climate mobilities in greater detail. Um, which is together with uh, uh, yeah, a set of different colleagues. Uh, also Mimi Scheller is uh, involved and uh, Carol Verbotko. Um, so key scholars who are writing on these topics. So it's quite exciting. So, the, so this presentation will also give some deeper context into uh, some of the points we make in that, uh, in that uh, issue. Uh, let me see if I, so I just go like this, like this. No, just here. Oh, this with this. Okay. Yeah. So um, the work on, on climate mobilities that started actually um, some years ago um, when we came together it, with a group of uh, scholars who work on these connections between climate change and uh, and migration, and we all felt somewhat uh, discontent with the way in which uh, this relations uh, was often portrayed and how it was often talked about. Um, um, also, I myself, I started on this topic uh, in, in, so in 2007 or so and coined uh, the term uh, climate refugees. I think also in that paper, I, I cited Norman Myers, which is, uh, who, who referred to uh, a two, that there would be 200 million uh, uh, environmental refugees by 2050, um, uh, an estimate that had later been critiqued um, for that it yeah, was, had a quite simple methodology for looking at uh, like how many people are living in that area, there will be sea level rise and that's how many sort of uh, estimations that are there. So also when I started out myself in this to topic, I started out with, okay, yeah, climate change, drought, uh, sea level rise, so there will be mass migration, yeah, of course, or, or something. I, I guess uh, that that's, was, was the thinking uh, that a lot of people have uh, when they start in this field, especially if they don't have a background in, for instance, human geography or something. Like, for instance, 
Uh, I myself, when I, I worked with Frank Bierman on that topic, and we came from uh, the field of environmental sciences, and I think uh, many people in that that field, the yeah, you don't per se know uh, the, the large body of literature on human geography and make two quick sort of uh, assumptions there. Uh, and then, but that was quite long ago. And then uh, I remember there being quite a lot of discussions, fierce discussions over this concept of climate refugee. Uh, back then, also from, for instance, uh, the UN uh, High Commissioner on Climate Refugee uh, on Refugees, <laughs> refugees UNHCR, uh, they were quite critical of us uh, coining that concept. While if you look now, it's it, how they are positioning themselves and sometimes presenting on this issue. I think also the climate is a little bit shifting that they're also often now making quite bold, yeah, sometimes bolder statements than we in uh, science do, while in the beginning, uh, at that point, they were still very like, no, 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 this is not the topic and not our mandate and uh, responding in that way. So, uh, but th back then I became interested in, uh, yeah, in how the topic was being framed and thought of in different ways. Uh, and started also to study the securitization of uh, of climate migration, so how it was framed in terms of uh, of security, um, and and that, and that was sort of and then in around 2010 or so, um, I remember that the debate shifted a bit. There was this uh, there was a, the foresight report came out by Richard Black and uh, some others with key migration scholars, and they sort of debunked that mass uh, climate mass migration uh, storyline and um, also argued that yeah, a new global treaty of climate refugees would be unfeasible and put forward this uh, driver's model of showing how migration is uh, always multi-causal. Uh, and also I think then uh, the, this idea that migration can also be uh, an adaptation strategy um, so, um, so not only an issue of, of fleeing, but could also be a way for people to adapt. I think that narrative came up back uh, uh, at that time. But then uh, uh, the Syrian uh, uh, war happened, and uh, there was the, a lot of yeah migration uh, talk about migration crisis in the EU. And then I think this narrative on climate refugees and mass climate migration came back quite. Uh, a lot and it felt that the, 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 the debate we had 10 years ago needed to be sort of uh, repeated. Um, and then um, we came together uh, with a large group of scholars, uh, Patrick was also uh, um, one of them, um, and, and wrote an agenda in uh, Nature Climate Change, it's called uh, Climate Migration Myths, and put forward uh, an alternative research agenda on, on climate mobilities. Um, and there we try to emphasize that the relations between uh, climate change and uh, human mobility are quite uh, uh, diverse, that you see a lot of different types of responses. So not uh, uh, only mass uh, migration flows or only forced uh, displacements, uh, which are sort of dimensions that you that were more often sort of in a more general audience uh, or in the media or policy uh, talked about, but actually um, has a lot of different sort of facets with, um, um, uh, with for instance, uh, rural urban mobilities and also uh, and uh, people uh, trying to return home or nomadic movements and circle mobilities um, and also connections between uh, sometimes moving away for a shorter term and coming back and trying to stay in place uh, and then maybe uh, moving away again. So it, it was also all not so so linear. Um, and we also tried to make a point that, um, that the climate mobility is not something completely new, uh, that, uh, that you can see all types of new migration flows, but actually that these, uh, intersect with already existing uh, mobility patterns, such as rural urban migration, um, and how then, um, uh, yeah, issues of drought or uh, erosion impacting on people's livelihoods, or for instance, uh, uh, on agricultural fields, and yeah, interplays with uh, already existing coping mechanisms of, for instance, moving uh, 
to cities and how and so we try to get a more of an embedded perspective as to uh, the role that climate change plays and how it intersects with different uh, immobility and mobility um, uh, patterns. Um, and um, in doing so, we also try to connect with this broader literature on mobilities, which I guess you all know uh, much about because of the many different lectures uh, that, that were there. Um, and with the work from uh, John Urry and uh, uh, Mimi Scheller, um, and also showing in that sense how, how broad this concept of mobilities is and that we should look at these different facets of, of movements, uh, also potential movements or forces of um, um, uh, situ stages of um, um, immobilization and uh, forms of stillness and dwelling and look at this broader uh, dimension in order to uh, yeah, come to a more nuanced understanding basically of the relationships between climate change and, uh, uh, and human mobility. And I, I think since then, uh, the field has also become somewhat more nuanced again. I think uh, many in, in uh, academia are taking this uh, somewhat broader uh, perspective. Um, even we just talked about it today that there's a new journal that is <laughs> being launched that is now called Climate Mobility and not Climate Migration. And I think even in these, uh, there were these World Bank reports on, uh, uh, again, different predictions of how many people uh, will come to uh, have to move. But also more using this language of, of mobility, so it tends to sort of, yeah, um, become accepted somewhat more, more broadly, though still I think discussions remain on how, how strong this driver of climate change is and, and also this, this point, right, on how what, do we, it, is everything really going to be embedded in these patterns or will we also see real new, new patterns and how will they differ, they differ from the existing patterns uh, that we see. So I think there are still discussions on that and, 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 and open questions there. Um, and, and sort of what this research agenda also tries uh, to do is add to this debate on the, the de-exceptionalization of mobility and, uh, and migration research, which is a goal that uh, Dahinde, and I forgot her first name, um, and Joris Schapendonk and others have been arguing for. Um, more and more generally also in, in, migration, in the field of migration. Um, um, also very much related to the what the, the, the mobility scholarship has also been arguing for sort of sort of that's often the uh, that's a set yeah um, staying in place uh, being settled that that is sort of the norm and having to move away that that is sort of out of the ordinary uh, and and what the uh, Hinden and Schapendonk also make the point is that sometimes we as scholarship also tend to um, reaffirm these these norms and these dichotomies um, also by uh, uh, yeah uh, wanting to focus more on these exceptional types of of cases um, so that's also something that we've been trying to engage with with this uh, research agenda and also to to see climate mobilities more in relations as I just mentioned uh, also in a previous slide to these existing uh, mobility patterns and uh, yeah, and how it evolves, uh, takes place and develops in the context of everyday life. Um, and um, this I just want to say, I guess for maybe for you, it's more, more obvious that uh, the, the shift from uh, talking about climate refugees or climate migration towards climate mobilities doesn't mean to suggest that it's, yeah, that it's not so that people are, are not in a very vulnerable situation or that they're uh, in just situations. That's a, a comment I, I, I sometimes get, especially if I have to uh, present to a yeah, more general audience. It's a bit like, yeah, but what is mobility? It seems sort of so fake and not important and not uh, like not raising the same type of idea of importance as, as climate refugees. And uh, do we then not avoid, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the risk that that not uh, enough policy will be directed towards uh, towards this issue, and that uh, we should fight for justice and 
it's sort of that's sometimes really the, the concern with uh, the concept of mobilities. Um, though I think, of course, if you, for instance, look at Mimi Scheller's work with mobility justice, there clearly is also very much a justice element, and and uh, and not um, all mobilities uh, are equal. Uh, some have more uh, capacities to move than others, and I think also how Mimi Scheller's work, for instance, shows in the. the that there are these elite mobilities of, uh, for instance, me who has now come to, to Vienna and others uh, very marginalized communities not able to move and not maybe being able to make a lot of choices as to their movement. And also injustices can appear in uh, very gradual forms of uh, climate mobility um, when a sea level rise is very gradually impacting people's houses and it doesn't come up as maybe a crisis situation, uh, but it's, it's, it is impactful and also about issues of, of, of justice. But I understand this concern maybe, yeah, from a more policy or political perspective that it's a concept that is somewhat, yeah, more difficult to communicate, um, basically. Um, yeah, with this picture, um, um, I, want, I wanted to, yeah, connect to this uh, idea of, um, let's just get this away. Um, of this de-exceptionalization of, of mobility and migration, uh, right? And on one hand, you have these, uh, which I'll later go, come into, uh, go to in the presentation, uh, these actors, these regime actors that do try to, yeah, create an exceptionalist, uh, exceptionalist li life type of movement and situation with border controls and emphasizing that it's not permitted to move. And, uh, and, and, and this is actually in, uh, in between Bangladesh and India, um, in the in the Sundarban area, and where they also look into uh, yeah in zones where you're not allowed to fish, or zones where you can cross and where you cannot cross the border. Though it used to be before uh, uh, the colonial uh, end of colonial rule, it used to be in a connected uh, connected area. But at the same time, you see how in sort of everyday practice, people across the border and uh, and how they also contest this idea that there's the border and just try to cope with that in their everyday um, everyday lives. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that tension basically uh, uh, in more detail later. So um, I will focus on, on three um, uh, dimensions. Um, and I was worried at first that I would be way too fast, but so I no, indeed gave a lot of more detail. So <laughs> just a few slides. <laughs> minutes, so. Okay, I won't have to worry, I guess. I was worried that would be done in like 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, so uh, I will focus on these three points. So the first is um, a bit more in detail on the relations between mobilities and, uh, and immobilities and reflecting also on our own biases in uh, in research on forced uh, uh, mobility, that we want to research the, uh, the exceptional. Um, also um, going in more detail about the intersections between climate mobilities and other uh, social material uh, mobilities. Um, and then on the end, the role of climate mobility regimes and acts of contestation and, uh, and resistance. And in doing so, I will draw on a lot of examples um, from the research I've done, which is largely in Bangladesh and Kenya, but also in collaboration with others in uh, in Chile or in, in Tuvalu. So it's a quite a yeah a, a wide range of uh, of examples uh, that I'll, I'll engage with. Um, so this first point on climate mobilities and immobility. So to to think back again that often, yeah, we have, when we think about a disaster or something, we think about uh, the sort of the extreme situation, the exceptional situation, and we want to focus often also uh, in our research on, on, on those dimensions, on um, issues of displacement and, and the things that we think are societally relevant to, to focus on. And, and that was also, this was a, an image from quite long ago, from 2007, uh, uh, in one of uh, reports from a German uh, uh, agency that then also tried to depict how climate change is leading to particular mass flows of, of, of movement. 
and detention seem to indeed often also when also when the issue is being visualized, uh, being focused on, on, on that direction, adding to a particular understanding of the of the subject. Um, but what we heard last for at least for a very quite a long time in, in the field was issues of, of immobility and people not moving away. Um, so this is a picture of uh, an island in Bangladesh in, in Kututia, where uh, here the, uh, you see the hole uh, at the sea. There used to be an embankment, and now about eight years ago or something, it was uh, destroyed when there was a cyclone. Um, and since then, it was prepared, but not really well, um, often because of uh, corruption or a lack of resources and a lot of different issues. So every time it breaks again and it opens. And so it means that people living here are basically um, every day when it's high tide, uh, yeah, the water comes and other times it's dry, whilst it used to be a very sort of lush green agricultural sort of area. So this is a bit how it looks like when, uh, when there's high tide. So the water's, um, the houses are sort of in the water. Um, and they made this, they called it cock sheet, uh, uh, to, to be able to, to get to the roads so if, if the children had to go to school or um, hmm, things like that. Um, but in the beginning, when this issue of, of immobility came up in the field, um, that was, I think, also around the time of this foresight report, uh, in, uh, so in around 2010. Um, and and uh, it was then called, referred to as trapped uh, populations. Um, and yeah, I think a problem with that conceptualization really suggests that people have no, no way out, right? That there are no means uh, to move away. I think in, in this case, you do see indeed that there yeah, are limited sort of um, uh, capacities to, uh, to move away, not always have the connections in, uh, in cities or other places to find work. And also a hope that uh, at some point this, this uh, um, the hole in the embankment will be fixed so that people can stay. Um, but I think also the, the problem with this concept of threat populations refers a bit to a discussion I think um, we had earlier today in the, the group of how, uh, yeah, that immobility is also not sort of a permanent situation and that, uh, that it's good to look at a longer sort of life trajectory and life courses and, and how uh, mobility and immobility can uh, that you have different stages in life, basically, and, and in some stages you experience immobility, but there can also be connected with um, situations of, for instance, short-term mobility. So it's also not 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 that um, clear cut. So in this example, for instance, a lot of people living here uh, they also wanted to go to uh, Chokeria, which is an area on the mainland which is a bit more hilly. Uh, and people feel, yeah, that's that's where uh, we want to go to. It's safe there. It's green. Um, so this is how it looks like. Uh, and people also know um, uh, people there who have already moved to, away, and for instance, live in temporary houses, um, as you see uh, here. This is a temporary house attached to uh, someone else's house. Um, and for instance, I met a family where uh, the mother uh, always. Um, well, not always, but often uh, sends her children um, to go to this area, um, for instance, after a cyclone and when the water is still quite high, that they think, okay, it's better safer if you go there for a longer period of time. Um, so in that sense, but she stays then uh, um, also with her husband to take care of the belongings and the stuff uh, there. They also have a cow. Um, and they also don't uh, want to move there, uh, like really relocate there, because they're afraid that uh, there are not enough jobs for her husband. At least now here in Kutubdia, he can do, he has a job in fishery and, you know, at least they have an income. Uh, so you see here how sort of this, yeah, this form of immobility is, is very much intersected still with um, very frequent uh, trips of uh, short term movement to higher places. Uh, where the children go for safety and they're trying to sort of manage their, their life by this mix of staying uh, uh, connected with, uh, with short-term short -term movement. And I, I think it's also difficult to see in such case if it's really like 
yeah, involuntary mobility or, or not, if it is quite difficult to, yeah, to put a label uh, uh, on it, uh, which in the end for policymakers is often yeah, quite useful to, to do so that they know how to help uh, the people in, as to what they want to do. Um, yeah, to, to reflect a bit more on this, uh, this bias that we sometimes have towards wanting to research this, these cases of exceptional movement, um, it's, it's also again based on a research I did myself in, in Bangladesh, in uh, the south of uh, Bangladesh. It's in, um, Patrick knows this, uh, <laughs> this story, but uh, um, it's, it's in a quite dynamic uh, uh, area of the Delta. Um, and uh, here are these green areas of land. This is a satellite based image of, of the area showing land changes over the last 30 years. 30 years. And um, the green areas are new emerging pieces of land. Uh, and uh, the blue is sort of what has been lost. Uh, and it's not because of climate change, but because of natural dynamics um, in the Delta. But what is uh, related to climate change is that. Uh, the area is often hit by cyclones, and that is uh, also, yeah, um, especially in areas where there's also already a lot of erosion going on, it has usually quite of a, a big impact. Um, so uh, others had, had done a big data study um, in this area, uh, uh, Lou Rattle and others in the climatic change, their study was published. Um, and it's, it's a big data analysis of anonymized mobile phone uh, um, uh, records. Um, and they traced, for instance, if you um, yeah, move uh, between uh, mobile phone towers, when you call, they can trace uh, your, your movement. And this, this data reflects um, yeah, the, the, these called detail records. And um, then uh, during Cyclone Moasen, which hit this area in May uh, 2013. And these red flows show um, exceptional, uh, yeah, um, out of the ordinary movements, let's put it that way. Um, because um, normally it was in the middle of the night, so normally there's not a lot of movement. So these red flows show sort of unusual movements, and blue are less uh, uh, flows than normal. Um, and, and they were presenting this image quite actively in our community um, and also uh, amongst policymakers as uh, uh, there's um, uh, Flowminder, which is a yeah, research think tank or they, they do more of these studies and um, informing uh, UN organizations or Red Cross or, uh, for instance, with uh, better preparedness for disaster management and where to focus their, uh, their work on. So, so when you see this image, uh, yeah, they, they hypothesized, and I would also uh, think the same, that this is about yeah, showing displacement and evacuation and in a quite chaotic manner because uh, the, the, the warnings came quite late in uh, this area for the cyclone, as it was expected to go in another direction in Bangladesh. Um, so this was the hypothesis, and yeah, and, and I uh, myself also fully went along with this. I thought, yeah. This, this is showing it, and this you 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 again very quickly make this assumption about that it's from this crisis-like exceptional type of movement that that we're seeing here. Um, and then um, because I, I was going to this uh, area in any case, I just the, I had a project on environmental migration in the digital age. I thought, oh, maybe it's nice to collaborate with them and uh, and go into the area and see in a bit more depth how this evacuation and uh, displacement looked like. Um, and so uh, we decided to focus on this area. Um, yeah, because there was a lot of unusual movement. So, and we hypothesized with David Redhall, like, uh, okay, yeah, this is this late evacuation, but strange though that the flows here go to the water. We thought, but okay, it's strange, but we, yeah, I'm almost a bit ashamed to say, but uh, but I think we even, yeah I think we even on the phone talked about maybe they, they it was too dangerous to go over the land and they decided to take the boat and you know it's crazy of course with storm to <laughs> to take the boat but do we I don't know we fully went along with it with it must be something with evacuation or displacement um, yeah so so but then I was there and asking around and yeah, like, uh, yeah, did you uh, go to the shelter uh, during that storm, uh, that cyclone and where, and how did it go? And yeah, people said they didn't really do that. 
uh, the, the, the embankments were relatively strong there. The water didn't go, go in, so there was a wind, but it was not per se so, so dangerous that you had to go uh, on the land, uh, had to go to the shelter. Uh, and uh, many people just stayed on these high roads in front of their uh, houses. Also, many of the shelters were located in quite muddy areas, so it was also not per se always super easy to, uh, to get there. Um, and I remember that at some point, yeah, I was talking with David, like, I don't know, I don't know what's, what's going on. Like, uh, yeah, we've, uh, we see that there were all these uh, unusual movements, but nobody said that they went to the cyclo shelter. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then we sort of started to more systematically map where all the, uh, the mobile phone towers are located and then what direction people would have had to take in order to sort of represent the flow that you see, see there. Um, and, and I noticed that I was also quite directive in my questioning, sort of assuming it was evacuation or displacement or something along, along those lines. And I started to ask uh, as exactly in this, this road, actually, more. Uh, there was also some, yeah, a, a bazaar like close by with shops, etc. And asking many yeah, people like, did you, yeah, that it was in the middle of the night. Do you remember that there were a lot of people on the move here and going in that direction? And it was a bit, I remember it's like my final try. And then uh, people were like, yeah, a lot of people. I was like, okay, where did they go? And then they were, yeah, the, they, went to, they go, went to the harbor. I was like, okay, why would they go to the harbor? Um, yeah, well, to, to protect their boats. Uh, and then it turned out um, that uh, because there were a lot of these small harbors with a lot of uh, fishing boats, and that the whole yeah the community there were all relying on these boats and some of them um, um, there are these trawlers uh, they were really big and uh, they invested a lot of money in them um, uh, so uh, yeah it was very important for them that these these boats wouldn't drift away or then wouldn't break so some people said like for instance you can work with 20 people or something in a boat and they were all asked by the owner to uh, yeah, to, to stay in the boat the whole night, and uh, they were calling uh, others like, "Hey, your boat is being damaged. You have to come, you, or you have to come and help." And um, and uh, and there was also a lot of interaction with those who give the loans, who are more in the, uh, the, the where the bazaar is located, um, and and sometimes they also went home in turns, uh, home in turns to see how the situation was because it was usually the men. So that's also the movement that you see are the men moving largely, uh, the women have less phones and were more sort of stayed with the house or sometimes even in the, uh, the psycho uh, shelters. Um, so, and, and it appeared that this strategy was not out of the ordinary or something, but they do this every time there's a, a storm or a cyclone and it's feasible to move around, they do it uh, in order to protect their boats. It's sort of a common lively strategy. So it was actually less sort of this situation of sort of exceptional type of movement, but quite sort of a well-coordinated strategy they had to in order to protect um, their boats. And um, yeah, something we hadn't expected at all. It didn't enter in our minds at all when you just see this picture and you don't know the local context and this is sort of shared everywhere. Uh, and yeah. Um, um, and, and, and this is happening st still uh, also with because they, they keep on making these type of data flows and uh, I remember also sending it to Flowminder, but I don't know, I didn't have the feeling they found it very, uh, very interesting. But uh, <coughs> yeah, for me, it, it really shows that uh, how quickly we, we can make the wrong assumptions and it can lead to a total uh, sort of mismatch also with uh, if you would come and try to, to uh, come and help people there, they need quite different support. Uh, 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 than you think. Um, and also, um, it turned out that this area where you don't see a lot of unusual movements is that, that there actually most of the vulnerability was there, it was most dangerous. Um, and that was because uh, there the embankments, because of the erosions that had taken place, were very weak. Um, so this is a large hole in the embankment. And uh, yeah, because embankments have been created in, uh, in Bangladesh. There's no very smooth sort of uh, flow of uh, in the delta anymore. So the sand uh, of the of the 
I don't know, I'm, I'm not very good in explaining this, but uh, <laughs> of the river cannot sort of go into the land. So what happens is that it sort of sinks here. So if the water then goes in, you know, it's, it's really dangerous. There's a lot of water. And, yeah. So people here, there was sort of in this case more of immobility of people not being able to move out and go and save their boats or anything else. They were trying to save their lives, trying to climb uh, rooftops, trees. Uh, and there was also a cyclone shelter here, but not, uh, yeah, and it is not very far. So around the same mobile uh, phone tower. And that wasn't picked up basically. That is all missed in, 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 in that uh, big data analysis, which then has a bias as well towards looking into to mobility and thinking that that is what we should focus on in uh, when, the, when there is a cyclone. Um, yeah, so here, this is a satellite based image of that area showing how, how uh, about three kilometers of land had been lost over the last 30 years. Uh, and Sometimes you see more holes. Right. Now, yeah, we just saw. Then there was a cyclone, then, then it sort of gets worse. And uh, yeah, so people here are in quite a difficult situation with often moving a little bit, a little bit because it's sort of, yeah, the erosion takes place slowly and then, some, uh, and then they move up, uh, especially the, those with uh, least uh, um, connections or resources. Yeah, they don't really have. Yeah, much other choice. So they, yeah, they, they actually move in a way, it's a sort of immobility, not being able to move out, but they move a lot of times, but every time just a uh, tiny little bit. Um, but um, yeah, these, but you also have to have this, this is what I just said was more these cases of immobility that, yeah, equals sort of more vulnerability in a quite difficult circumstances. But um, the literature, oh, someone wants to answer. Um, maybe I missed it. Um, but the literature also shows um, that we also have to look into yeah, resistance towards the need to relocate and also uh, people who want to stay. So it's being referred to as, for instance, uh, voluntary uh, immobilities. Um, work I did with uh, Hanne Wiegel, she, she led that uh, work for a PhD, um, is for instance in, uh, in Villa Santa Lucia in Patagonia, where there was a, a mudslide and uh, the whole village was destroyed and uh, the government even made a new site uh, for the village to be uh, rebuilt, but people um, uh, refused to, to move there and they were like, uh, even though the, the experts and the governments were saying like, yeah, but climate change is increasing the risk that it will happen again. There, yeah, but our identity is to live, be able to live with risk. That's why we live in Patagonia. We're used to that and uh, uh, we don't want to move away, even if you give up subsidies or anything. So, so you see also a lot of these patterns and sort of forms of place attachments around many different sites of the world. Um, also, um, Carol Verbotko is showing that in, uh, a paper that will be in our special issue on the, on, the, on, tu, on Tuvalu. Um, I'll get to that also in more detail later. Uh, how um, um, how people are um, uh, yeah, often the focus with the Tuvalu with the small island states is that people yeah you have to move away these these, these islands will sink there's yeah it will will go underwater that is the only strategy and that's often the narrative they hear from the outside, um, but people in Tuvalu, many of them also wa want to stay and feel very close to their islands, which is, yeah, their ancestral land. And uh, so she sh looks into cases of anti-displacement, how uh, people are um, yeah, dredging sand and trying to support uh, the area, rebuilding uh, houses, making more land, uh, also as sort of a political statement to show we want to stay and don't, um, uh, want to leave, um, and but also here in, in in Europe we see these dimensions. For instance, with the recent floods in in the summer in Belgium, Germany, and uh, the Netherlands, uh, master student I supervised did research in uh, in Falkenburg in uh, Limburg in the Netherlands, the south of the Netherlands, and of course there was displacement uh, there. But after that, a lot of people went back home, and if you ask them about yeah, how do you see your future? Do you think you want to stay here? Do you, yeah, with the risk of it happening again? 
do you maybe want to move away? And most people are like, yeah, that, that for us wouldn't be, be the reason also where else should we move if we move towards the lower areas in, in, in the Netherlands. There may be other problems in the future of sea level rise. So it was also, it was in one end a feeling like, no, I, I, I feel very attached to the place where I am, but also like, yeah, not seeing a lot of other options and possibilities also with high uh, prices, of course, of housing and the idea, can you sell your house? Um, so you see a lot of these dynamics, I think, uh, of, yeah, uh, of, of uh, immobilities being both involuntary and voluntary on, on many different uh, sides of the world. So it's very clearly, I think, uh, an important theme um, for research. Also, um, in Bangladesh, this is again this area where, where I showed this uh, erosion that was taking place. Um, where for the last sort of 20 years, three kilometers of land was being lost. Uh, they are now finally sort of after 20 years, a bit further ahead, the embankment was being rebuilt. And that was because someone from the area was finally in the parliament and therefore funding was enabled uh, and, and sort of hope returned to the area. And uh, people who had moved away or parts of the families who had moved away were contacting each other via Facebook and other means uh, to show how uh, yeah the embankment was returning and people were also returning back home. Um, so it was in this area. Um, I just skip this uh, and and making um, um, for instance here there was a family who was making fish ponds and they were actually many of them had moved away to Dhaka and got other jobs because of the erosion. They all their agricultural fields got destroyed and they were like okay. <coughs> There's no, yeah, way to have a livelihood here. But uh, yeah, with the news of, of, of this embankment, et cetera, sort of hope returned, investments returned. So you see that, yeah, it's not an also one way out. A lot of people uh, want to go back and you see a lot of, yeah, different sort of directions of these mobilities um, sort of taking place. Um, which often, yeah, also has to do in this case with this sense of, of safety. And apparently here, when you see a new embankment, you think, okay, I'm, I'm safe and yeah. Um, to, so to sum up that, that first point, I think uh, what I try to show is that you see a bias towards researching mobility and especially this more crisis-like uh, form. And also I myself uh, am very guilty of having, having uh, that bias. I've, yeah, um, so I think it's good. To, to reflect on, on that uh, as researchers and uh, uh, yeah, to, to be open-minded uh, uh, when uh, in the field and not going there with too many uh, presumptions. Um, and it showed how immobilities can reflect vulnerability, but also these forces of resistance and even empowerment, like in, in for instance, in Tuvalu, how local communities are really stepping up and showing, no, this is what we want and we want to have a say in how our climate future uh, looks like. Um, and, and this is relates to, yeah, what we talked about uh, earlier, how there's no dichotomy between mobilities and immobilities. Generally, I think as also, uh, yeah, the, the, the work on translocality that uh, some of you uh, here, uh, do show how, how uh, yeah, th those who stay in a particular place and those who move to another place, of course, in any case, stay connected by sharing ideas, financial resources. So in that sense, there's never really a dichotomy between immobilities and mobilities. But you also see it with one person even that, that uh, or one family that you have different forms of, of mobilities that you can witness or so some staying in place, others uh, uh, leaving to the city um, or, or uh, first um, uh, staying in place and then short term going to your family-in-law when it's too unsafe and this hilly area and then moving back. So it's a quite complex set of, of, of mobilities. Um, yeah, and in order to, um, uh, it made me think of, uh, I just put this in a bit last last minute because we, in, yeah, in the afternoon, I think we were talking about how you could trace, uh, yeah, with, with Patrick and <laughs> others, um, of how you could trace these connections between Immobilities, immobilities in a sort of 
the trajectory of, of someone's life and how someone is moving and staying in different points of time and how, how to uh, trace that uh, made me think of a framework for analysis uh, we published in, yeah, in 2018 in global environmental politics on environmental mobilities and had this framework that in order to understand yeah, particular mobilities uh, patterns, you have to look into yeah, the, the social and material dimensions. So the infrastructures uh, that are in place, uh, uh, the institutions uh, shaping it, uh, but also the particular frames and ideas and understandings about this particular movement, um, but also look into the temporal dimensions. So how quick is the movement or how slow is the movement? For instance, in case of climate mobilities and with the, the fast onset events, the crisis situations is often short term movement and you go back um, or you go to uh, you have to stay in a shelter for a longer period of time and then have to wait for a longer period of time. And you have the more gradual climate impacts that also impact the, the mobility very slowly that you see the people moving step by step with the idea, OK, probably I can still stay and make it work. Um, and then also spatially, the, the distance is, is quite can be quite small. Uh, so it's, it's good to look into, in addition to how it changes, I guess, over someone's life trajectory, also to look into these different dimensions to see the difference in the, sort of the types of mobilities. Um, and this brings me to the second point of these intersections with uh, um, social material mobilities. Um, and also this, this picture showed because we made it with people who look, for instance, in plastic mobilities, uh, cruise ship mobility. So there are a lot of different mobilities and that sort of are intersecting and interplaying with each other. I'm seeing indeed it. Is, time is going very fast. <laughs> I put a lot of slides, so maybe I should uh, skip something. Uh, okay, yeah, so, yeah. Huh? <laughs> um, yeah, so so it, so I also did research in in, in Kenya and uh, with pastoralist uh, herding, and there you really saw this intersection of these all these different forms of, of mobilities. Uh, that in in a, in a way there was uh, yeah an uncertain climate with longer periods of drought, but also sometimes uh, a heavy rain. Um, but uh, it also intersected with uh, um, what maybe what you could term educational mobilities with a lot of more opportunities for especially the youth uh, to educate themselves and to go to the cities. Um, and then I looked into digital mobility. So the, the, the information and ideas that were shared via mobile phones and, uh, and social media. And this was all intersecting with each other and also cases of uh, immobilities as uh, this area uh, 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 used to be um, yeah, when the British came, they, they sent uh, a lot of the pastorists here to reserves and uh, they took a lot of the land. Um, when the British left, uh, uh, yeah, some of these pastorists could, could return, uh, but they, uh, the landowner still kept the land and it's really large pieces of, of land, it's gigantic. And so, and the pastorists are sort of locked in within these very large areas of land, which now sometimes are sort of wildlife reserves. Um, and it's really now become a differentiation between where the wildlife can be and where the pastures can be. So it's also this sort of, yeah, sort of some pressures for, to immobility that you see. Um, so I wanted to look into these this, this mixes of these different types of mobilities and especially with digital mobilities. Um, and, and for instance, you saw here that in um, um, that pastoralists, they have to share information, for instance, about where there's still grass, where is it dry, where, where, where's the rain, uh, where uh, the people sort of uh, exchange information when they see each other when walking with the cattle and it's called Syrian, or they sit together uh, in the evening, uh, they, they, they group together and it's called sort of Syrian and they talk and, it, but, and they, yeah, they observe. Uh, it's quite mountainous, so you can see where there's thunder, where there's rain. Um, uh, it, it, they looked also at the stars, so there were different sort of things that people were looking into. And it's, this was increasingly sort of becoming mixed with uh, yeah, information gathering via phone and, and WhatsApp. And then not so much via these big group WhatsApp exchanges as that was a Syrian was also very much based on trust that you know each other and you, you meet each other, you see each other face to face. 
So these big WhatsApp groups that was yeah, not always so trustful, but if for instance, a son who was still at home would call in and say how the, the, the grass was at home um, because they had a more stable home where they would often uh, sort of come to, uh, or they would send pictures of how the situation is uh, that would then yeah, be taken up in the group. So it became sort of mixed of, of the images that people would send and the information and, and people would call in. Um, and this, this was, for instance, of uh, the locust. Then there was uh, images sent around of where these were. Um, yeah, go to the next slide before I stay stuck. And then, um, but you also saw, as I said, yeah, that, that the people there is increasing less freedom to move. Uh, so a lot of people also transitioned to using uh, cattle and goats as it was sort of less expensive. And also because of the heavy rains and uncertainty about when it rains and when it's dry, uh, they feared to stop the cows and the, and the yeah, so they, they moved increasingly to this. And, um, and the phone was again sort of interplaying with that, that increasingly the livestock was held somewhat more locally because of these policies and these restrictions with land access, but also because of this, and then the phone would become sort of a way to uh, say, okay, this area we're gonna, uh, you cannot graze on now, and later on we'll graze there, you have to leave it alone. So then if someone would trespass that, they would make a picture so that they could give it a fine, or they would uh, walk at the borders of uh, the area of their, their village basically and see, they warn others when uh, there were trans uh, trans uh, 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 other pastors coming in and, and, and shaping it. So there was sort of also some surveillance or something sort of coming connected to that. Um, and you also saw um, that, yeah, a lot of people moved to the city for education or jobs. This is one of, or one of them. It became quite a rich sort of uh, uh, businessman. Uh, but at the same time, he had three big herds back home. And he was all managing that via phone. I tried to yeah, do an interview there, but he was constantly, it was called, but uh, whether the cow needed antibiotics or what do we needed to do now? And uh, also when it was, um, for instance, there were too many rains, so they had to decide to go to a, a, a lower area where it was uh, warmer. And he had to advise the, the, the herdsman that he hired on that. There was also someone being shot, I remember. It was quite a dangerous site. So, and he was managing, um, all that uh, and, and, and at the same time another job and sort of yeah so this phone allows for these sort of translocal connections to to take place and uh, uh, and emerge i'm gonna skip this uh, yeah so um these intersecting social yeah yes yeah, so yeah this, this sort of different types of mobilities you see and uh, sort of it's, it's sometimes a bit easy, uh, like uh, often, also, yeah, especially with the, I think, this case of pastoralism, it's very difficult to connect it to the climate changes, I found, and also changes in patterns of movement, um, because there's so much going on with, uh, yeah, these, uh, these rural urban mobilities, these, uh, these educational mobilities, the, the digital and the information that people get. It's very, very difficult, I found, there to, uh, to really see what is the impact of, of, of climate change there. And it's really uh, set, uh, look like more of this hybrid and intersecting set um, of, of, of mobilities. Um, and these digital technologies, in this case, yeah, pluralized basically how the pastoralists navigated the restrictions they had um, in moving and also how they coped with environmental changes in that they had their own observations and interactions, but also used these images and pictures they got from others in other places. Um, and in that way, um, yeah, you could see that pastoralists sort of do maintain their pastoralist identity, though there are these forces to settle and being restricted in movements, because also because of the phone, they can go to a lot of different places and stay connected and, um, um, and have their sort of mobile identity sort of remains in, 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 in that context. Um, and then sort of the final uh, topic <laughs> on climate mobility regimes. Mm. Yeah, I think um, a lot of time in our, our field, we often look more into sort of, yeah, local dynamics of, uh, of how people move and uh, et cetera, or, or people designed, looked into big uh, global treaties on how to protect climate refugees. 
But I think there's been somewhat less attention to uh, what I refer to here uh, as climate uh, mobility regimes, um, sort of how different types of actors uh, uh, frame, manage and regulate this nexus between climate change and, uh, and mobility and trying to govern it and steer it in a particular uh, direction. And in the broader field of migration, there's a lot of, a lot of literature on migration regimes and mobility regimes, uh, but it has been somewhat less applied uh, in, the, in this field. And um, we thought in a special issue, at least, that it would be interesting to focus more on that. And then not only the, the migration regimes, basically, but also how climate adaptation policies and programs are also shaping uh, uh, mobilities in a, in a particular way. Um, I'm gonna skip this for time. Um, yeah, for time, I think I'm just gonna go directly to the examples. Um, so an example of that is, is for instance, with the, the Marshall Islands, uh, it's in an article from Bordner and uh, others who show how this, this impact of, of climate mobility regimes on, on the perceptions of, of local movement, how especially external donors and, and Western media frame the small island states as sort of lost to climate change uh, and uh, waiting for sort of inevitable, uh, like unavoidable uh, relocation uh, and how uh, local communities, but also local governments actually want to try also adapt in place and want to have funding and support for that but are not receiving it because of this dominant narrative, no, you are the future climate refugees. Um, and, and Bordner and others, they are uh, critiquing that as sort of, yeah, new sort of neo, uh, as neo uh, colonial dynamics um, that uh, deprive the islands of, uh, of their state, state sovereignty over their own adaptation strategies. Um, and that we need to return sovereignty over adaptation and decision making to affected states, but also to the communities themselves as to how they they want to participate in, in framing uh, and, and seeing how they should um, see their yeah climate futures and that this is not determined by some global network of uh, of uh, donors etc uh, as as to how they should uh, survive. Um, another example of that is in uh, in Bangladesh is from Kasia Papoki's work. Who showed how um, this is a picture of uh, of Kulna in the, the west of uh, uh, southwest of Bangladesh, where there used to be a lot of agricultural fields uh, and rice uh, uh, cultivation, but it has been transformed into uh, a shrimp uh, agriculture project. I hear I hear someone in the background, but maybe mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, shrimp agricultural uh, project and it was already a sort of trend started in the 80s uh, that the World Bank promoted that because it would lead to more export uh, export for Bangladesh and economic growth but uh, in recent years the World Bank uh, but also Dutch engineers and others who had an yeah, interest in that have been increasingly linking that to climate change uh, there were yeah um, uh, uh, even sort of sort of board games in trying to envision the future of this area of Bangladesh and it was sort of suggested like yeah well this area will be lost to sea level rise in any case so let's already transform it now so that we can economically profit from it um, and sort of this, again this impact of this, this global uh, climate mobility regimes but here also very much connected with local NGOs like WWF and the national governments who went along with this and people became displaced as a consequence of this because, yeah, uh, there was not a lot less jobs available in this market. It's generally less nice to, to live. So a lot of people moved to cities and that was then sort of framed as an, uh, an adaptation strategy as something also the, the government should promote because, yeah, the area is not unlivable in any case. And she probably critiques this as that these, these, these regimes um, or governance that they are, yeah, caught uh, with their anticipatory politics are creating already a situation of anticipatory ruination, like ruined area now already, uh, because it will be lost uh, in any case, and that uh, and alternative futures are ruled out of those discussions, those um, the, 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 the people living in these areas were not heard and not giving a voice into how they would envision the areas and, and, and their future lives. Um, and um, yeah, uh, 
Another um, example is uh, how yeah, these, these climate mobility regimes tend to focus on, on these, these crisis situations. Yeah? We want to help for uh, displacement and that's what we need to focus our energy into. But these gradual climate changes uh, that are sort of being ignored and overlooked and people don't get any support. Um, and uh, this one, maybe I should just skip. Um, and uh, to um, and I think it's important maybe to to end with that is to um, can I have like five minutes and then yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay uh, is is that we should also look into acts of resistance and contestation of these climate mobility regimes that they're not only sort of yeah dominating and saying how everybody should uh, um, um, move or not move and which movement is noticed and which is not. Um, so there's also scholarship looking into that, uh, so how to navigate the climate mobility regimes that comes from uh, Schapendom's uh, work and, um, and FIC. Um, uh, how, how, and they, they look more generally into, into migration flows and uh, how, how people uh, yeah, try to improvise and try to create room for maneuver in, uh, in a situation of control. Uh, but you also see more direct forms of resistance and contestation. Um, and, and that um, you can see, for instance, uh, this was in Bangladesh, in Tutia, that first island where I talked about, where, where, with this embankment that was gone. There you see, for instance, forces of resistance of the local communities start to really start a, a protest with also Facebook uh, was quite active on it demanding uh, that uh, the military would come and fix their uh, the embankment and really try to get it to the national parliament so that finally something was being done. And last time I was there, it was being fixed more properly. So maybe they also uh, succeeded in doing that. Um, and these are the people from Tupelo who, uh, um, they're called the Pacific Climate Warriors. And um, this is sort of their, how they, uh, they, they went back to their indigenous roots and uh, using canoes and etc uh, uh, to try and block, for instance, uh, industry, uh, coal industry and uh, boats uh, and that are used in, in the context of that industry and really trying to show, hey, we exist, we want to stay and you have to listen to us. And so there are a lot of these acts of, of resistance. Uh, and but also more yeah subtle forms like in the pastoralists i think they don't have a lot of room for maneuver but they sort of seem to accept more the situation of of land access but they do try to yeah when it's dark enter the areas uh, where they're not supposed to and especially when it's dry then there's conflict and then the resistance becomes much more visible but in, when, when they're when the situation is somewhat okay they try to navigated in a somewhat more smooth uh, way. Um, and this, I think I'm going to just skip because of time. So um, yeah, to sum up with the climate mobility regimes, they frame and govern relations between climate change and immobility in a particular direction. Um, and it's good to also look into these forms of counter power um, regard, um, against these, these climate mobility uh, regimes. Um, and to conclude, I think this, the research agenda on climate mobility is what we try to do with it is steer towards a more, uh, focus more on a more dynamic and plural understanding of these relationships between climate change and mobility playing out in different older parts of the world, not only the global south as most of our research has been on, but uh, I think as the events for instance showed in the, in the, in the north of the Netherlands with, uh, and in the north of Europe, uh, shows it, it, it takes place uh, everywhere. Um, and mobility and immobility are interrelated concepts. Um, and we should study them as such and not in a too static manner. Um, and also how mobilities themselves are quite diverse in nature. They don't have purely climate mobilities. It's often intersected with other types of mobilities. Uh, and we should also understand uh, the interplay with climate mobility regimes and these, yeah, the role of power and politics in that context and how, for instance, in this case of, of, of Bangladesh with Kuna, how uh, there actually the displacement uh, because of these uh, shrimp uh, agricultural projects were framed as sort of climate displacement, but were actually a consequence of, of the sort of the, 
yeah, the, the, the reshaping of the land that World Bank and other actors were doing. So it's also good, to, I think, to be, be reflective of, of that um, and, and uh, look into these forms of counterpower and ways people are uh, navigating these, uh, these um, regimes. Yep, I'll just stick, <laughs> stay there. <laughs> Thank you very much.